Namaskar. That was uh, Sadhu Om uh, singing the third verse of Akshram Lai, which is the verse I'm going to be talking about today. Um, what Bhagavan says in this verse is, Aham Bhuhan Dietun, Ahaguhe Sireyai, Amabita Dengol Arunachala. If it's split up, uh, it, that becomes Aham Bhundu Etu. Un ahaguhe siriai amabittadu enkol arunachala. That means arunachala entering the mind, carrying away, keeping captive in the cave of your heart is what? Um, the, the implication of that is arunachala entering my mind or home, forcibly carrying me away or dragging me out, or attracting me to yourself, uh, keeping me captive in the cave of your heart is what a, won- is what a wonder, implying what a wonder of your grace. Um, there is an alternative meaning, but I will talk about that uh, afterwards. Um, so the, the surface meaning of this verse is quite clear. That is, Arunachala entered Bhagavan's we can the word aham can mean either home or heart or mind. So Arunacha entered his mind, um, forcibly carried him away or attracted him to himself, and he's been keeping a, 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 a captive in the cave of his heart. That is, as Bhagavan says in the um, in the first verse of Arunacha Ashtakam. Uh, Ari varu siru vayadu adu mudal aranachalam miha peridu ena ari vinilanga ari hilan adun porul adu tiruvanamalai ena oruvaral ari vu ura petram. What that means is Though from my young age, when I was bereft of knowledge, Arunachalam shone in my awareness or mind as something exceedingly great. Even after coming to know from someone that it, that it is Tiruvannamalai, I did not know its poral. Poral means its substance, reality, truth, import, meaning, or significance. So as he says in this verse, even before he knew anything else, Arunachala was shining in his awareness, in his heart or mind, as something exceedingly great. So it had already entered his mind by the power of its name, even before he knew what that name actually signified. All he knew is Arunachala is something very, very great. But what is Arunachala? He didn't know. So that's how Arunachala... Um, entered his mind. So it, it, the implication here is from the t- even before he knew anything else, as a very small child, our natural m- had already entered his heart. And then st- dwelling stealthily in his mind, unknown to anyone else, it eventually revealed itself to him as his own real nature, one day after overwhelming him with an intense fear of death, thereby drawing his mind inwards to see what it is that shines as I. That is when that fear of death came to Bhagavan, instead of um, thinking about his outward life, thinking about his his mother or his uh, brothers or his relatives or um, anything else, 
his mind went in, that is, when his body dies, am I also going to die? That, that is, he, he didn't think this. As, as he said, this all happened spontaneously. His spontaneous reaction was to turn his attention within to find out whether with the death of the body, I will also die. And because he turned his mind within so keenly and intensely, he, uh, Aaron actually revealed himself uh, within, in his heart as his real self. And then six weeks later, by the power of its magnetic attraction, it forcibly dragged him away from his home in Madurai to its own earthly abode in Tiruvannamalai which is the heart or spiritual center of the world. And there it kept him a prisoner in its caves, never allowing him to be separated from itself, even physically. So it is clear when we consider the meaning of this verse, it, 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 has, um, it has a meaning both on the physical level, how Aranach entered his mind, and pulled him out of his home and brought him to its own home in Tiruvannamalai. That's on a, on the, on the, on the, from an outward perspective. Inwardly, Aranatra entered his mind by, that is, in the form of the thought, Aranatra. That thought eventually drew his mind inwards and thereby established him in the cave of the heart which is the true abode of Arunachala. So it, it's, it's a beautifully, um, that's what Bhagavan expresses here, it's a very beautiful idea because it, it shows the, what happened in the outward course of his life is, um, is almost an allegory for what was happening inwardly. So it, it, what was happening within his heart was reflected outwardly in the life of his body, but his body was brought by Aranachala, by the power of attraction of Aranachala. He drew him from, um, from, from Madurai, from his home in Madurai, to his own home uh, in the caves of Aranachala. And Aranachala is the heart of the world, so he refers to it as Ahagohe, the cave of your heart. Um, there's also a very clear um, nayaka nayaki connotation in this verse. Um, that is, this is Arunachala Akshara Manamalai. It's a, it's a, it's a marriage garland. So it's written in that um, bridal barber. So it, according to that bridal barber, Bhagavan is a 16 year old maiden, a nayaki, uh, the heroine of the story. And Arunachala is the Lord the hero of the story who has stolen her heart. Stealthily entering her home, he enticed her out to elope with him. That's one way of viewing it, or we can express the same thing in another way. He, he entered her home and he forcibly seized and abducted her. Um, and now he's keeping her a prisoner in the cave of his own, uh, that is his own home. Um, I'll just say one thing to, ex to explain this uh, context a little bit more. In a lot of the ancient Tamil literature, the, the Sangam literature, a lot of it is, um, is love poetry. And um, in, in those days, that is a few thousand years ago, society was different to how it is now. So there were different forms of marriage. If a, if a man... Uh, came and took a girl and eloped with her, that was a considered as a form of marriage. Um, so sometimes he, I mean, he, he, it usually wouldn't happen, but she'd be taken against her will. Usually when there are two lovers, they fall in love and then they elope together. That's the usual thing. But it can also be taken as that he forcibly entered and he abducted her and he's keeping her a prisoner. We can take it, we can take it in either sense. I think those... They're, they're, as I say, in ancient times, there were different forms of marriage. Um, some were, like in modern times in India, but arranged marriages. Some were um, like this, elopement. And there's different, different forms. It was a different type of society in those days. So it's alluding to the, 
to that uh, to the to the ancient Tamil love poetry is is alluded to here. But obviously here it's not in a literal sense. It it, it is in an allegorical sense. Um, that is the God is the Purusha, the male, and all the jivas are um, are, the, uh, are female. Um, Krishna and his gopis. What Krishna and his many gopis represent is the one God and the many devotees. Um, so the, these all have deep allegorical significance. So the, the maiden, the nayaki, is the devotee or jiva whose home is the mind. And her beloved Lord is God or Shiva, whose home is the heart, the cave that lies buried deep in the very center or in the most core of the mind, from which there's no possibility of escape. So uh, Arunacha has drawn him out of his home, the mind, and drawn him into his own home, that is, let's say his and her, because that makes it clearer. That is, Bhagavan is the, is the maiden. So uh, Arunachala has entered her home, the mind, and drawn to his home, the heart. And there he's keeping her a prisoner. And there's no possibility of escape. That is, he's imprisoned her and ensured that she can never escape from him in the most effective and infallible ma manner, namely by capturing and occupying her, her entire mind, her entire heart, so completely and thoroughly, but no thought of leaving him could ever rise in her. Um, so we, we can see from it, when we, when we think deeply about the meaning of this verse, it, there's so many... Um, connotations and illusions, but the actual meaning is very, very deep. How, how, um, how God enters our mind and uh, draws us with that. Our, our mind is outward facing. He enters our mind and draws it back within. And there in the, in the depth of the heart, he keeps us a prisoner because having, having been, uh, having been drawn into the depth of the heart, we've lost ourselves in him. And therefore, there's, after that, there's no, no escaping from him. We are eternal prisoners um, by being one with him. And once we are one with him, as he, as, as he says in the next verse, in the yard, who can leave there? Who can leave that? I cannot leave you. You cannot leave me. Um, as I explained before, the word aham in Tamil has two meanings. That is, it, there's both a, a Sanskrit pronoun, a first-person pronoun that means I, and that's often used in Tamil uh, literature in that sense. But there's also a, a separate Tamil word, aham. It, 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 the spelling and pronunciation is the same, but it, the, the Tamil word, the pure Tamil word, means in, inside, what is inside, and therefore it implies the mind, the heart, or home. Um, and um, the next word is puhundu. It, it, that's an adverbial participle that means entering. So aham puhundu. So uh, in, in this context, he's not using the aham in the sense of the Sanskrit pronoun. Uh, some places he uses it with the double meaning, but here he's using it just in the Tamil sense of uh, mind, heart, or home. So aham puhundu means entering my heart or entering my mind or entering my home. We can take it in, 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 in any, of, uh, any way. Um, essentially, mind and heart here are synonymous. Um, uh, because the, the term mind is, is, um, is it, it, we, the term mind is a very flexible word. In some contexts, the mind means, sorry, the, the term heart is a very flexible word. In some cases, when we use the word heart, we use it to mean the seat of emotions. In some cases, the mind in general. In some cases, it means the, the very innermost center of ourself, our own real nature. So we need to understand from the context in, in which, the sense in which the heart is being used. In this, in this case, it's referring to the mind. But it can also mean home but in a physical sense. So, um, uh, and then the next word is another adverbial participle, irtu, 
That has um, a range of meanings, it, including dragging, pulling, attracting to itself like a magnet, like a magnet pulls something towards itself by, by its power of attraction. And it also means carrying away, like a, a current of a fast-flowing river or a flood. Um, so, aham buhundu etu means entering my heart or mind or home, carrying me away, dragging me out or attracting me to yourself. Um, and then the next word is un, which means your. And then aha uh, guhe. means a cave. Aha guhe means your, un uh, aha means your inner cave, your heart cave or the cave of your heart. That implies the cave that is your heart. That is, the heart is, is itself a cave, and that is his home. That is the true home of Aranachala. That is our true home also. Um, and then sire uh, means, um, it, it's again got a range of meanings, uh, all closely related. It can mean confinement, incarceration, prison, captivity, slavery, slavery or bondage. It can also mean a captive, a slave, a prisoner, and often in um, in uh, love, Tamil love poetry, it's a term that's used uh, to refer to a young woman or a young girl who has been taken uh, captive for the purposes of marriage. That is, who's who's been uh, seized by a man in order to take her as his bride. Um, the next word, I, is an adverbial participle that means being, it's often used in Tamil in the sense of as. So sirei means being captive or as captive. Um, but in English, actually, I didn't translate it because um, in English, whether you say keeping captive or keeping as captive, it, may, it means the same. But we don't usually, it's more natural in English to say keeping captive rather than keeping as captive. So, um, so I omitted that word in the, in the, in the translation because it's understood. Uh, in English, it's clear. If you're keeping someone captive, that means you're keeping them as a captive. Um, and then the next verb is I'm a well, it's actually a, a participial noun, but I'll explain how it's formed. The, the, the participial noun is ama vittadu. Ama is a verb that means to abide, remain, rest, or be settled. And ama vi is a causative form of it. So it means to cause, to remain, or to keep. And uh, ama vittadu is a participial noun formed from that. So it means uh, Causing to remain or keeping. Um, so, un ahaguhe sirei ama vittadu is a noun phrase that means keeping me captive in the cave of your heart, or so more literally, keeping me as captive in the cave of your heart. Me is not actually there, it's obviously it's implied. Um, and then the next word, n, uh, means what? as an expression of wonder. Uh, and the word after that, kol, is um, it's sometimes used as an affix implying doubt, but it's also often a poetic expletive. So we don't have to in, um, translate it in this case. In, in, in this case, n is used as an exclamation, as an, ex, as an exclamation of wonder. So the, the, the literal meaning of aham buhun detu Un aha guhe serei ama vittadu engol is um, entering my heart or mind or home, uh, carrying me away or dragging me out or attracting me to yourself, keeping me captive in the cave of your heart is what? Implying is what a wonder. In other words, what a wonder of your grace this is. N also mean, can also mean why or for what reason. So another meaning of this verse is aham buhun dietun un ahaguhe sirei amabitudu n also means uh, entering my mind, um, carrying me away, keeping me captive in the cave of your heart is for why, for what reason. 
implying why why did you do so or for what reason did you do so that it implies for what reason did you bestow such grace on me that i'm so unworthy so worthless and undeserving what for what reason did you choose me it is the implication there um so there's so many but when using very simple words it's it, uh, conveying so much meaning and implication um so these these the meaning of this and so many other verses of akram rai right, they're so deep in meaning and there's so much connotation and implication in them that's why they give room for being um for being interpreted in so many ways and they in this way they they are suited to us in whatever mood we are whatever bhava we are singing with when we recite it there's some meaning that will be a, or, or some shade of meaning or some that will be applicable to our state of mind so this is a this akram lai is such a precious work because this is this is this is depicting the true state of mind of an aspirant someone who is who is struggling on this path because as bhagavan often said this spiritual path is a battle within our own will in our own heart between our vishaya vasanas our inclinations and likings to go outwards which of us those in vishaya vasanas are the seeds of all our likes dislikes desires attachments hopes fears anger jealousy all these um all these passions that the root of the, the seeds that give rise to them are our vasanas and the vishaya vasanas of the vasanas the inclination to seek happiness in anything other than ourself is a vishaya vasana but there's by his grace he has planted in our heart the seed of love that's the seed of vasat vasana the inclination just to be as we actually are to seek happiness in our own being so that, that generally when we start on the spiritual path our, well always when we ever start where our inclination to go outwards is far stronger than our inclination to go inwards so there's a battle going on and slowly slowly by turning with him more and more we strengthen the sat vasana and we weaken the vishaya vasanas that's how this this battle is eventually won um so akram lai is all about this inner struggle going on in the heart of the devotee so bhagwan will be pleading with arunachala sometimes scolding arunachala chiding him but it's all because it's it's all a, how we can cling to our natural more and more and of course our natural is not just the external form our natural is though though he out of his grace he's appeared in the external form of the hill he is ever present in our heart as i um so as i say this word n it can be an expression of wonder what or it can be a question why or for what reason whether we take in, in whichever sense we take it the implication is that the grace of arunachala is not caused by anything that is he's expressing when he expresses wonder uh, if we take that meaning he's wondering how arunachala is so gracious i am so unworthy but he he has so uh, out of his own accord he's entered my heart he's uh, he pulled me out of my own home and put uh, my mind and pulled me into his heart and keeping me a pres- prisoner there not because of any any um merit on my part it is purely of his infinite grace that he has done so so that's why bhagwan often expresses wonder at the grace of arunachala um he, or if we take it to be a question why or for what reason he's asking her natural that the, the implication is for what reason did you do so why did you choose to save me in this way when i'm so i i didn't have any punya or i didn't have there's nothing about me but i didn't even have genuine love for you but you have entered my heart so much seed of love for you in my heart and uh, drawn me to you so uh, whichever sense we take that the, the meaning of the word n the implication is that the grace of arunachala is not caused by anything 
least of all by any merit on our part, graces his very nature because he is the infinite ocean of uh, Aniamil Ambu. That's a term that Bhagavan used in verse 5 of our Natural Pancharatnam. That's a beautiful term. Aniamil means without other. Ambu means love. So love without another or otherless love. That is the nature of Aranachala. So um, because, he, because Aranachala alone is what actually exists, he doesn't see us as other than himself, so he loves us as himself. That is, as he says in the first sentence of verse 6 of um, Aranachala Ashtakum, Undoru porul arivoli ulameini. That means there is only one substance. One substance implies one thing that actually exists. There is only one substance, you, the heart, the light of awareness. So Arunachi is the one thing that actually exists. Arunachi is the heart. Arunachi is the light of awareness. That which is shining within us as I am, in other words. Um, so the implication there is that Arunachi alone is what actually exists. So whatever else seems to exist cannot actually be anything other than it. Therefore, in the clear view of Arunachala, who is the light of pure awareness, there is nothing other than itself. So it loves everything as itself. Arunachala is like the gold. We are like gold ornaments, the rings, the bangles, um, and so on. In the view of gold, all these ornaments are nothing other than itself. Because we identify ourselves with a particular form, I am a ring, I am a bangle, I am a necklace, we, we, we seem to be something, we, we are claiming an identity other than the gold. But what we actually are is just the gold. So the Arunachara is that gold. He's, the, he's that light of pure awareness. He's the heart. He's what we actually are. Um, but because we identify ourselves with a, as a form, we fail to recognize the substance, our own, that is our natural, the real substance. He is such it, pure being, pure awareness. That is what we actually are. But because we've identified ourselves as a form, we are not aware of, of, of ourselves as our natural. But in his view, he's aware of himself as a substance. So he doesn't see any of the forms as other than himself. So in his view, we have no existence other than him, himself. So he loves us all as himself. So the love of Arunachala is, is infinite and all-embracing. And it's equal. It's, it's, there's no partiality in his love. He doesn't love some more than others because he doesn't see any otherness. He doesn't see any differences. So he loves us all equally. And this love is what we experience as grace. So that love is the very nature of Arunachala. In fact, Arunachala, love and grace, they are all synonymous because they're all words to but refer to the one thing that actually exists, namely the heart, the light of awareness, light of pure awareness, I am. So that is what Bhagavan often used to say, grace is that which is shining in the heart as I. Um, and he used to, I mean, he, he, he said it in so many ways. He said, people complain that God is ungracious, but it is we who are ungracious. God is always gracious. He, is, he has made himself so easily available to us by shining in our heart as I. So his shining in our heart as I is the ultimate grace. But we are so ungracious. Instead of lovingly attending to him, we are attending to all the objects of the world. So um, uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa used to say the same thing in his own homely way. He used to say, the grace of three people are necessary. The grace of God, the grace of Guru, and the grace of Jiva, the grace of ourself. The grace of God and the grace of Guru is never lacking. It's always abundant. It's always, uh, there's never any deficit in that. But deficit lies in our grace. We are not um, gracious, uh, loving to turn our heart, uh, our mind within, our attention within. So we are the ones who are lacking grace. He is not lacking grace. He is, his grace is ever showering on us.
but we are not availing ourselves of his grace because we well, well we're misusing the grace by look instead of attend, looking within attending to him lovingly in our heart we are allowing our attention to go outward seeking happiness in things other than ourselves uh, overlooking the infinite happiness that is our natural who is always shiny in our heart as i um therefore grace alone is what actually exists so there cannot be any cause for it and there need not be any cause for it because grace is the very nature of our natural he doesn't need any cause to be gracious to us he grace is causeless many people of a of a lacking a deep spiritual understanding may say oh i i came to bhagavan in this life so i must have done very a lot of punya because of my punya in previous lives i came to bhagavan in this lifetime that is not the case his grace is not dependent on our papa or punya he doesn't bring us to him because of our punya he brings us to him because of his infinite grace in spite of all our papa he brings us to him so it's not his grace the the bestowal of his grace is not caused by anything other than his very nature um the the deeper implication of this of this verse uh, is um our natural entering my mind the nature of which was to always face outwards and thereby wander in the world of may in the maze of worldly delusion uh attracting me uh and and thereby putting my mind in was to face yourself you had thereby been keeping me uh captive in the cave of your heart what a wonder of your grace this is so this is the, the inner meaning but for, so this is the process of grace by which our natural draws us to himself the first step in this process is our natural entering the mind so to understand what bhagavan means by entering the mind we need to consider what the mind is and what what and when we understand the nature of the mind we can then understand what is meant by our natural entering it um bhagavan has taught us a lot about the nature of mind um but one of the things he's taught us about the mind is that other than thoughts there's no such thing as mind for example he points this out in the fourth and eighth paragraph of nana in the fourth paragraph of nana he says manam embudu atma sarupa tilulla or adiseya shakti that means what is called mind is an adiseya shakti an extraordinary power but exists in atma sarupa atma sarupa means the real nature of oneself uh uh adu sakala nene bugaleum totru vikindradu it makes all thoughts appear or we can loosely translate it it projects all thoughts um uh uh nene bugale elam niki parkindra podu uh when one looks excluding all thoughts taniyai manam endro porul ille um solitarily there's no such thing as mind that implies other than thoughts but excluding thoughts there's no such thing as mind if we if we set aside all thoughts and look there's no such thing as mind to be seen um ahayal nenave manatin sarupam manadin sarupam therefore thought alone is the swarupa the very nature of the mind and he says the same thing again in the eighth paragraph he says Nineve manatin sarupam. Thought alone is the sarupa of the mind, the very nature of the mind. Nanenum nineve manatin mudal ninevu. The thought called I alone is the first thought of the mind. Aduve ahankaram. It alone is ego. So, um, what he means here by thought, um, when we in usual language when we talk about thought we tend to have a a fairly limited we 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 fairly we tend to give the a, a fairly um 
uh, limited meaning to the, uh, to the term thought. That people often uh, say, for example, I was meditating, I didn't have any thoughts, I was uh, without thoughts for 20 minutes. What they mean in that context by thought is the mental chatter. But Bhagavan uses thought in a much broader sense. According to Bhagavan, that, that the sense in which Bhagavan uses the term thought, it includes all mental impressions, all mental phenomena of any kind whatsoever. So all perceptions, memories, um, emotions, uh, reasoning, uh, likes, dislikes, everything is, is just thought. Um, and of all these thoughts, the root is the thought called I. Um, that's why he says in the next sentence of the fourth paragraph, Nene Vugale Tavitu, Jagam Indro Porul, and Niamai Ile. That means excluding thoughts, there is separately no such thing as world. That is Bhagavan often used to say that the world is nothing but thoughts. In another place in Nana, in the 14th paragraph, he says, um, um, Jagam Embudu Neneve. What is called the world is only thought. So it's all that is what we see as the world, it's only a series of mental impressions. And mental impressions are thoughts, according to Bhagavan. So there's no excluding thoughts, there's no such, there's separately no such thing as a world. So according to Bhagavan, everything other than our own real nature is a thought. But thoughts that constitute the mind are of two kinds, namely the thought called I, uh, which is ego, the subject or knower, and all other thoughts, which are objects known by ego. Since other thoughts seem to exist only in the view of ego, none of them could exist without ego. So ego, the thought called I, is the root and foundation of all other thoughts. As he implies uh, in the final four sentences of the fifth paragraph of Nana, there he says, Manatil tondrum nene vugal elabatricum nanenum neneve that means of all the thoughts, or for, literally it means for all the thoughts that appear in the mind, the thought called I alone is the first thought. Um, the first thought, mudal nenebu, it can be taken to mean first, primal, basic, original, or causal thought. So that is the thought from which all other thoughts spring. And then in the next sentence he says, Idu arunda pirahe enia nenevugal erukindrana. Only after this arises do other thoughts arise. Uh, wh why is that? Because all other thoughts exist only in the view of ego. So no other thought can exist prior to the rising of ego. First we rise as ego, then we're aware of other thoughts. Um, and then he says the same thing in, in using other terms. Um, in, in the previous two sentences, he refers to ego as the thought called I. Here, in the next sentence, he refers to it as the first person. Only after the first person appears do second and third persons appear. The first person is ego, e ego the, the prime, this uh, first thought called I. And second and third persons are all other thoughts, or all other things. So only after the first person appears do second and third persons appear. Without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. That means without ego, nothing else exists. However, not only do all other thoughts depend for their seeming existence on ego, but ego depends for its seeming existence on other thoughts, because without grasping other thoughts, it cannot rise, stand, or flourish. As he uh, points out in verse 25 of Ulunapadu, what he says in verse 25 of Ulunapadu, grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form, it grows abundantly. Leaving form, it grasps form. If sought, it will take flight. Such is the nature of this formless phantom, formless demon called ego. Uh, or, or means investigate. So um, 
the forms that ego grasps are all thoughts, because everything up above and up my sort is a thought. So the forms we the ego grasps are all thoughts. And since they're thoughts, they it is as he said in that uh, fourth paragraph, it causes the mind is what cause or mind or ego is what causes all thoughts to appear. So all the forms that we see are thoughts that we ourselves have projected. We as ego have projected all the other forms. And since ego is a formless phantom, all forms are things other than itself. Therefore, ego is the root and essence of the mind, and it cannot rise, stand, or flourish without grasping things other than itself. So its very nature is to always flow outwards, uh, away from itself towards other things, which are all just thoughts that it itself has caused to appear. So since since its nature is to attend constantly to other things, it never looks at itself. So it does not see what it itself actually is. Though ego is just a thought, it's a thought unlike all other thoughts, because whereas all other thoughts are jada, uh, that's they're devoid of awareness, ego is chit jada granti. Chit jada granti means the not formed by the Semi entanglement of pure awareness with a body, which is jada. Of course, pure awareness is never entangled, but from the perspective of ego, awareness now seems to be entangled with the body because we're aware of ourselves as I am this body. I am is the pure awareness, chit. The body is what is jada. So that, that conflated awareness, I am this body, that is the chit jada granti. So, uh, Unlike all other thoughts which are jada, ego is the only thought that is endowed with awareness. It is therefore what is aware of all other thoughts, and it is aware of itself as I am this body, in which the fundamental awareness is I am is chit, which alone is sat, what actually exists. Therefore, this fundamental awareness I am, bereft of all adjuncts, is the reality of ego. But in order to see its own reality, ego needs to turn its entire attention back within to face I am alone. So long as we're looking outwards, we're aware of ourselves as I am this body. Uh, but only when we look within will, the, will this adjunct the body drop off and the pure I am alone will remain. However, since ego cannot survive as ego without constantly attending to things other than itself, to forms, its natural inclination is to continue grasping other things and not to turn back within to see what it, it itself actually is, namely Satchit, the uh, adjunct free pure awareness I am. This is Maya, that is the very nature of the mind is to be always looking outwards. Because when we rise as ego, we feel we, we, we have separated ourselves from the infinite happiness that we actually are. And we, we now have mistaken ourselves to be something finite. So as ego, we always feel something is lacking. So because the lack seems to be within ourselves, we look to fill that lack outside. We think, now I'm not so happy, but if I have more money or if I have a promotion in my job or if I have better health or if I have um, better relations with my, with my relatives or if I this or that, or if I get a new car or a new television, or um, or if I uh, study more and become more learned, we're always thinking that the, the lack is in us, so we want to fill it from something outside. So the very nature of the mind or ego is to be always looking outwards. This is Maya. Um, um, therefore, Turning back within is going against the very nature of ego. So ego will be willing to turn back within to see its real nature only when it is possessed by a love greater than itself, namely the pure love that is Arunachala. Therefore, Arunachala possessing ego with pure love to turn back within to see itself is what Bhagavan refers to in this verse as aham puhundu, entering my mind. That is, the whole spiritual path begins with, by his grace, 
which is the infinite love he has for him, uh, us as himself, he, he plants in our mind a seed of love uh, in the form of a satvasana. That, that planting of that seed of love, and, and of course that love is Aranatya himself, because there's no love other than Aranatya, because he is the infinite ocean of love. So the love that he has given us, in giving us love to turn within, he is beginning to give himself to us. So he's sown the seed of love in our heart. That is what Bhagavan implies in this verse by aham puhundu, entering my mind. So Arunacha has entered his mind in the form of love. And that love is not a love to go outwards, but a love to go back within. Um, Arunacha is, of course, always present in our heart as I am. However, so long as we prefer to look outwards uh, than to lovingly attend to him within ourselves, we are willfully ignoring his presence. So we fail to recognize that he is that which is shining within us as I am. Therefore, until he suffuses us with love to look within, to see him as he actually is, namely the pure awareness I am, he seems to us to be not present within ourselves. So we can become aware of his presence only to the extent to which he possesses us in the form of pure love to look within and thereby surrender ourselves to him. So though he's always present in our heart, we, we are unaware of his presence. So only when he, when he sows that seed of love to look within in our heart, uh, do we begin to become aware of his presence? So this is what Bhagavan means by entering my heart. It doesn't mean that Aaron is somewhere outside and enters our heart. He's always in our heart, but he, he, he begins to make his presence in our heart. Uh, uh, he, begins to, he begins to make us aware of his presence in our heart by giving us the love to look within. So to the extent that he occupies our heart and mind in the form of such pure love, he thereby draws our attention back within, like a, uh, a needle, like a magnet attracting a needle towards itself. So this is what he implies in this verb, in this verse, by the next verb, the adverbial participle etu, which means drawing, dragging, pulling, attracting to itself like a magnet or carrying away like a flood. So he, he first enters our heart in the form of love, and that love then pulls our attention back within. So when love for him arises from within and takes possession of our own heart, we would thereby be pulled inwards by him, like a straw being carried away by a powerful flood. And we will thereby be dissolved forever in his swarupa, which is the infinitely clear light of pure awareness, which swallows everything within itself. As he says in verse 27 of Akshram Lai, what he says in verse 27 is, Sakalam and Birangam, Kadiroli in a mana, Jala Jamalati Daranachala. That means, Sakalam and Birangam, Kadiroli inna. Inna means uh, sun. Uh, 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 Kadi Oli means bright light. So, son of bright light, uh, 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 Sakalam and Virangam, that swallows everything. Um, mana Jalajam, uh, Mana Jalajam means my mind lotus. Uh, uh, alati, uh, Alati do Aranach, Alati do Aranachala. That means uh, make the mind lotus blossom. So the nature of Aranachala, he is the sun of bright light, that implies the light of pure awareness, I am, but swallows everything. When the mind turns inwards to face you alone, everything else is swallowed. So he, the, the prayer is, make my mind lotus blossom. That implies blossom with all-consuming love for you. Um, the state in which ego has been completely swallowed, along with all phenomena, the shares, by the clear light of pure awareness, which is Aranachala, is what Bhagavan describes in this third verse as 
wisst ihr, was er wächst am Leih ist, und er hat gut hei Syriai am Abit zu tun. Keeping me captive in the cave of your heart, that is, having swallowed us and absorbed us into himself, we, there's, we, there's no escape for us. We, we are eternal prisoners in the cave of his heart. Um, when Aaron actually thus imprisons us in the cave of his heart, he does so by revealing to, a, to us that the Ahaguhe, or heart cave, is not only his, his home, but also our own real home, our natural state of pure awareness, as he implies in verse 97 of Aksharam Lai. This is also, this is a, a, very similar to this verse, but slightly differently worded. What he says in verse 97 is, mm -hmm. uh, What that means is, Vidu Vitu Etu. Vidu Vitu literally means leaving home. But Vidu Vitu Etu means uh, Etu is pulling or, uh, or alluring for, away from my home, is the implication. So alluring away from home, Ula uh, Vidu Puku, entering the heart home, Paya Un Vidu Kartine. Uh, you quietly showed your home, Arul, Grace. What that implies is, Aaron actually alluring or dragging me away from my false home, in other words, the thought-filled mind, entering or making me enter the home of my heart, the empty space of pure awareness, you quietly, gently, softly, or secretively um, Uh, showed me uh, that my but but my heart is itself your real home is the implication that's the implication um, uh, and he ends by saying arol in this context arol means uh, arol means grace so in this context it implies such is the greatness of your grace so this is very similar to that uh, to the verse we're dealing with verse three. Um, The vidu, vidu means house or home or abode, in, in which the devotee was previously residing, believing it to be his real home, is the mind, which is filled with thoughts about other things. But he has now left that false home, having been attracted, allured, or dragged inwards by Arunachala, as he implies by saying, vidu vitu etu, uh, which literally means uh, drawing, attracting, um, alluring, pulling or dragging away, leaving home. That is, the leaving there it implies what we, in English we say, um, uh, dragging away from. So, bitu, which literally means leaving, implies away from. Aranacha re resides in the heart of a devotee. So, this bidu or home, so this is the bidu or home to which it has drawn him, drawn him. This is, uh, he says, Ulla uh, Bidu Puhu. That literally means, Ulla uh, Bidu means the heart home um, or inner home. Puhu uh, uh, means entering. So uh, lit uh, that literally means entering the heart home. However, in this context, we can also take it to mean causing me to enter the heart home. That is, these verses, Bhagavan's writing very, very, briefly and cryptically. So often we have to read more meaning. That is, in, uh, causing me to enter the heart home would require more words or syllables. So he put it in a very, uh, uh, entering the heart home, it, it implying causing me to enter the heart home. Um, if we take it to mean this, the implication is quite clear and straightforward, namely, Drawing me away from my false home, the mind, you made me enter my true home, the heart. That is the implication. However, we can also take it in its literal sense um, to, to mean it, it, 
uh, it, it, um, if we take it in the literal sense, it implies that Aranacho has entered our heart home. But this is obviously not meant literally, it's meant metaphorically, because our heart is his eternal abode. And hence, he, he, he can never leave it even for a moment. As Manika Vasaka um, famously sings in the second line of Shiva Puranam, in my purudum in nengil ningad tal talvaha. That means may the feet of the one who does not leave my heart even for a moment of blinking flourish. So even for the tiniest moment, but for the moment it takes to as to blink our heart, our eyes, even that for such a tiny moment, he never leaves our heart. So he, but though he is eternally present in our heart, however. So long as we rise as ego and thereby reside in the mind, his presence in our heart is concealed from our outward looking vision. So it's only great saints like Manika Vasco who have so much love to look within, who are aware of his eternal presence in their heart. Um, so we must have such love to look within. Then only we will be aware that he is ever present in our heart. He never leaves our heart, even for the twinkling of an eye. Um, so, uh, so because of our outward-looking view, um, our outward-looking vision, we are we we are turning a blind eye, so to speak, to his presence in our heart. We are we fail to recognize that he's present in our heart. So. Um, so Aranatra entering the heart home is a metaphorical way of saying, but by drawing our attention away from the multitude of thoughts, but compromise the mind back into the heart, the empty space of pure awareness, I am, he reveals to us that he is ever present in our heart, in our heart as our heart. Because um, the term heart is used both to refer to the place where he resides and to he, uh, uh, Aranach is both in the heart and he is the heart. Um, the adverb paya uh, means gradually, slowly, quietly, gently, or softly. But in this context, it doesn't, it's not used in the sense of gradually, it's used in the sense of, uh, of, uh, of quietly or softly, in the sense of secretively, unknown to anyone else. Um, in another verse, he says, Yara Mariaden, uh, with unknown to anyone. Um, uh, so uh, unknown to anyone. So Paya here implies he he very quietly and softly he he, he does so um, without uh, being known to anyone. In fact, even without being known to us, because by the time we come to know it, he follows us. Um, uh, and this, this adverb, uh, paya, it can be construed either with the previous clause, um, uh, uh, ula vidu puha, entering the, um, the heart home. So it can mean he secretly or quietly entered the heart home. Or if we can take it with the next clause, which is the main one, uh, un uh, sorry, un vidu kartine. You showed your home. So quietly you showed, you revealed your home to me. Quietly and secretly, unknown to anyone else, you revealed to me your true home, which is my heart. Um, uh, in this context, the main, the, this main clause means you showed me, uh, but that, what he referred to in the previous clause is the ullabidu, ul the heart home, but that is your real home. That's uh, one implication here. Um, so you showed me your home. What is your home? My heart home. Um, uh, moreover, the word vidu in Tamil, vidu means home or, or house. It also is used in Tamil to mean our ultimate home. In other words, the state of liberation. That is on the spiritual path, this is the path back home path to our original home. So our original home is the state of liberation. So uh, liberation in Tamil is often referred to as vidu. Just thinking whether I can give an example where Bhagavan has used it. Um, 
yes, in verse 2 of Upadesh Undia, when he's talking about karma, he says, Vineyam vilevu vilevitu vittai vinikadal vritidam undipara vidu tarile undipara. That is, karma, the fruit of action perishes, but the seeds, the vasanas, cause us to fall in the ocean of action. Therefore, action does not give liberation. The word he uses there for liberation is this word vidu. Um, so vidu had this also, though it's, the basic meaning of vidu is, um, is home. In the spiritual context, vidu means liberation. So... Um, since vidu means liberation, un vidu kartane implies you showed your vidu. Uh, in, sorry, un vidu kartane means you showed your vidu. That, uh, that means not only you showed your home, you showed me liberation, your liberation. In other words, you showed me your real state, which is liberation. Therefore, since annihilation of the ego alone is liberation, as he says in verse 40 of Uludunapadu, and since ego can be annihilated only by Swarupadashanam, that's by seeing its own real nature, the implication of this 97th verse of Akshramlai is that by drawing us away from the mind, back into the heart, Arunachya shows us our real nature, which is his home, and thereby eradicates ego. So this, this verse 97 and verse 3, they're very, very close in meaning. Um, what he says in this third, coming back to the, the main verse we're talking about, the third verse of Akshram Lai, what he says in this verse, um, Aham Bohan Dietun, Aha Gohe Sereai, Amabita Dengol Arunachala, Arunachala, entering my mind, thereby attracting and pulling my mind inwards to face yourself. This is the implied meaning. Um, you have thereby been keeping me captive in the cave of your heart. What a wonder of your grace this is. The very same idea is also expressed by him in the last two lines of um, verse 9 of Arunachala, Mani Mani, Ar Ar Arunachala Navamani Malai. What he says in the last two lines of that uh, verse is en manamani, en manamani means entering or occupying my mind, irtu, uh, pulling me or drawing me, implying drawing me inwards, uh, um padatil uh, irtane, you've, you've fixed me or you established me at your feet. Uh, uh, padam has two meanings. It can mean feet, it can also mean state. So you fix me in your own state or you fix me at your feet. It, it means the same because his feet are his real state, his state of pure awareness. Um, uh, and then in, that's the third line. In the fourth line, the last line, he says, Chinmaya nam arunachala ninnaro chittaramene. Chinmaya nam arunachala. Oh, arunachala who are chinmayan, who are one who is composed of chit, of, of pure awareness, ninnarul chittaramane, what a wonder of your grace this is. That is what he says in this word, in this verse, this third verse, in one word, en, what, he, he puts it very explicitly here, right? what, what one implies there, uh, namely what a wonder of your grace, is he says explicitly here, uh, what a wonder of your grace this is. Um, that is what he describes in this third verse of Aksharamlai as un ahaguhe sirei amabittadu, keeping me captive in the cave of your heart, is what he describes in this in the final verse of Namamani Malai as un padatinil iritane, which means you fix me at your feet or in your state. Because the cave of the heart is not only his abode, but also his, abo his feet and his real state. Um, so, in, 
because this is all love poetry. Bhagavan is using so many different, he's using so many beautiful descriptions, but what he's describing is essentially the same, whether he's talking about grace or about his feet or about his heart cave, it's all one and the same thing. It is all, he himself is, uh, is all these things. And when he draws us into the heart cave, he reveals that he is ourself. We are self for that. Um, in other words, Arunachari is himself the heart, the place where he dwell, uh, dwells, as Bhagavan implies in the second verse of Arunachar Pancharatnam, in which he says, Nityamum na nendridea na ditti duvayal umpetan idiom endridavatam. That means, since you dance eternally in the heart, as I, they say your name itself is heart. That is, heart means the center. And in this context, it means the ultimate or innermost center of ourself and everything else. At the center of all that is experienced is the experiencer, namely ego, the false awareness I am this body. And at the center of this false awareness is the real awareness I am. So the real heart, the heart both of ego and of everything else, it is only this fundamental awareness I am, and that is Arunachala. So he, he is both in the heart and he is the heart. Since, it is, since Arunachala is shining in the heart of ourself, it is said to be the heart. Uh, but it is not just in the center of us. It, sorry, it is said to be in the heart, but it is not just in the center of ourself. It is itself the center of our soul. So it is not just in the heart, but in the heart itself. Therefore, Ahaguhe, the heart cave, is not only the abode of Arunachala, but is Arunachala himself. So imprisoning, so being imprisoned in his heart cave means being uh, imprisoned in himself. And we can be imprisoned in him only by losing ourselves entirely by in him. Uh, uh, I'm a bit to do, uh, uh, keeping me captive in the cave of your heart is therefore the state in which ego has surrendered itself entirely to him and has thereby been completely eradicated by him. So this alone is the state in which we are that, namely our natural, as Bhagavan implies in verse 27 of Uludunapadu. What he says in 27, verse 27 of Uludnapri, this is a very, very beautiful verse. The state in which one exists without rising, without I rising, is the state in which we exist as that. Without investigating the place where I rises, how to reach the annihilation of oneself in which I does not rise. Without reaching that annihilation of oneself, how to stand in the state of oneself in which oneself is that. The state in which ego is annihilated and can therefore never arise again is what he describes here as tan adu am tan nile, the state of oneself in which oneself is that. That here implies Brahman or Arunachala. So this is our natural state, which is the real state of Arunachala. So it is the state that he described in this third verse of Akshramlai as un ahaguhe siriai amavitudu, keeping me prisoner in the cave of your heart. And in the final verse of Navamani Malai, he described it as un padatinil irutane, uh, you fix me or establish me in your state or at your feet. Um, as he implies in the second sentence of this 27th verse of Uludanapadu by asking rhetorically, Nan Udikum Tano Made Nadamal, Nan Udia Tanirepe Savadu Eban. Without investigating where I rises, how to reach the annihilation of oneself in which I does not rise. What this implies is we cannot achieve the annihilation of ego except by investigating the source from which we've risen as ego, namely the heart our fundamental awareness I am, which is the surupa or real nature of Arunachala. However, we cannot investigate this fundamental awareness I am without all-consuming love to surrender ourselves entirely to Arunachala. 
because as, as he said in the previous verse of Uludhanapri, verse 26, when ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. When ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Uh, ego itself is everything. Therefore, investigating what it is, is giving up everything. So in order to investigate ourselves, in order to investigate the source from which we've risen, namely our nature, we need to be willing to give up everything. So without all-consuming love, we cannot... Uh, uh, we, we cannot investigate and know what we actually are. And we cannot uh, achieve such love unless Arunachala occupies and takes complete possession of our heart and mind in the form of the love that he always actually is. So his occupying and taking complete possession of our heart and mind is what Bhagavan describes in this um third verse of Aksharam Rai as Aham Puhundu, entering my mind or heart. And by doing so, he automatically draws our entire mind inwards to face our fundamental awareness, I am, thereby eradicating ego and establishing us forever in the heart, as he implies by saying, ear to, uh, pulling or drawing within or attracting, un aha guhe siriai amavittadu. Keeping me captive in the cave of your heart. What a wonder of his grace this is. As he says in the final line of verse 9 of Arunachala Navamanimalai, Nin uh, Chinmayanam Arunachala, Arunachala who are Chinmayan, who are composed of pure awareness, one composed of pure awareness, Nin uh, uh, Chittermene, what a wonder of your grace this is. Therefore, the implication of this verse is that grace is absolutely essential in this path of self-investigation and self-surrender. Because grace is the infinite love that Arunachala has for us as himself. And since it is, its love is the only real love, it is the source and substance of all other forms of love. So it alone can give us the all-consuming love that we require in order to turn back within and thereby surrender ourselves entirely. Since it is the bright sun of pure awareness that shines eternally in our heart as I, it gives us this love from within by gradually attracting our mind inwards, thereby filling our mind with love to give ourselves entirely to him. The love that Arunachala thereby gives us is nothing other than itself, because it itself is the infinite love that it has for us as itself. So by searching in our heart, as this love to know and to be what we actually are, it is giving itself to us, thereby dissolving us completely in as and as itself. As he implies in verse 101 of Aksharam Lai, uh, another very beautiful verse. Ambu vilalipol, amburu vunilene, anbai karaitaral Arunachala. What that means is, Arunachala, be gracious, melting me as love, in you, the form of love, like ice in water. Or we can, we can slightly paraphrase the saying, Arunachal, like ice in water, lovingly melt me as love in you, the form of love. Because grace and the word he uses for uh, be gracious is arul. Arul also implies love, so we can take it as lovingly. So um, as Bhagavan often used to say, Grace is the beginning, the middle, and the end, thereby implying that it is grace alone that attracts us and draws us to this path. It is grace alone that guides us and supports us along it, and it is grace alone that will finally swallow us entirely, thereby revealing to us that it is our own real nature. That is, grace is our natural, the infinite ocean of love, and we can yield ourselves to his grace only by turning back within with heart-melting love to know and to be what we actually are, which is what he actually is, namely the infinite space of pure being, pure awareness, pure happiness, and pure love. When we thereby give ourselves wholly to him, he will melt us as love in himself, the form of love. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arunachala Ramanaya